All right, if you have your Bibles with you, if you would take them out, please open them to the book of Hebrews in the seventh chapter as we continue our examination of Hebrews. Join me in standing, if you would, out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. And we've come this morning to Hebrews chapter 7, and we will move on now to verse 26. So Hebrews 7, beginning at verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son, who has been perfected forever. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you give to us grace and help us to understand the wonder of what you have done in saving us. God, let us always fight against everything that exalts man and only seek to exalt the risen Christ. God, let us think on the mercy and the majesty and the glory of what you have done in saving for yourself a people. And over all that we do, make much of Christ. For it's in his name we pray. So, as we start out this new section, I, I want to spend some time thinking about the glory of Christ in what he does as high priest. And we're going to spend a few weeks on this verse in particular. But... Most importantly, what I want to do is I want to think this morning with you about what it means that God has provided for us a high priest who is fitting. And, and the implication that's on the backside of that that we may not really think about. For we often tend to think that salvation comes to us because, well, we're good. If you talk to people and you talk and listen to what they say and what they think, most people believe, as a general rule, that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. And this gives them some sort of hope and confidence in their own lives and in their own doing, because most people think that they're good. Most people think that I'm a, I'm a good person. I don't do the really bad things. And if I do the really bad things, I'm, I was provoked, and it's not my fault. So I'm a good person. And that's the way we think about things, but that is not consistent with truth. What the scripture teaches us is that we need a savior. And we need somebody who is outside of our condition and outside of our own existence to reach into our mess and rescue us from that which we have created by our sin. This is what Christ has done. And it is absolutely, completely fitting that God would provide a Savior for us because apart from the Savior that he provides, we have no hope. Apart from the Savior that God himself has ordained and empowered and provided and delivered, we have no hope and no opportunity for anything other than destruction. And so I want to think with you this morning about this, this fitting reality of what it is for us to have a Savior provided by God. There's no man on earth who can do this for us. There is no person of any religious organization who can deliver us from our sin. It doesn't matter whether he has been ordained or christened or appointed or elected or appointed himself or whatever it might be. There is no man who can deliver us from the condition of our sin. It is Christ and Christ alone who himself was fully God and fully man. The writer of Hebrews points out here that it was fitting that Jesus become our high priest, fitting both for our need and fitting for the display of his awesome glory and spectacular beauty. <coughs> Pardon me. So let's start off by considering this need. Um, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah 64, we, we will come back to Hebrews, but Isaiah 64, and I, I want to just examine what the scripture lays out for us regarding our condition. 
Starting at verse 4, it says this. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has any eye seen God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. And in these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. We are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have consumed us because of our iniquities. This is the condition of man. We are sinful. Everything that we do takes us away from God. Our natural bent, our natural inclination, our natural desire is that which is contrary to God. We, not to put too fine a point on it, we hate him. The natural man hates God, hates the things of God, hates the things God says, hates the things God loves, and ultimately sets themselves in as an opposite a direction from God as it is possible to set. Now, if we're doing this and we still want to think that we're good, we are deceived. If we're doing this and we still want to pretend that there is something about us that is somehow commendable to God, that he would choose us instead of somebody else because of something in us, we're not only deceived, we're arrogant and foolish. What the scripture contends is that at the end of the day, God chooses to save us for his purposes and his delight and his glory, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with us because we are filthy rags in his sight. All of our righteousness, it says, is filthy rags. So what does this mean to us? We, we might say this, we might quote this scripture once in a while, but what does it actually mean that our righteousness is filthy rags? Well, your righteousness would be the very best that you can do. So at the height of your humanitarianism, at the apex of your love for mankind, at the very summit of your religious fervor, the very best that you can dredge up is seen by God as worse than garbage. And God looks upon our righteousness and judges it according to its actual worth and not our thinking or desire or preference or whim. So if you're going to rely upon your righteousness to get you to God, you need to understand what you're actually dealing with. What you're dealing with is garbage, is filth, is refuse. It's worse than the most vile thing you can imagine. And God sees it for what it is. It is a dark picture if you're hoping in yourself. This means then that since all of our righteousness is filth and all of our righteousness is defiled, that there is no hope whatsoever of you coming anywhere near God on your own. You can't come to him. You can't please him. You can't approach him. You can't even turn in a Godward direction in your own power. You can't think about God in any way that is consistent with truth, and you cannot do anything that pleases him on your own strength. The very best that you can do is to run harder and faster after hell. That's it. That's all there is. So if you're not accepting of the truth that there is a need for a priest, you are condemned and remain so. If you are not understanding that there is the need for somebody to stand between you and God who is not you and who is not like you in any way and who has not sprung from the same root that you have sprung from, then there is no hope whatsoever for your eternity. You can cast yourself upon anybody that you want apart from Christ and find no hope and no help and no comfort and no promise. And this is the reality of what the scripture teaches us. Every effort that we make to come to God is contrary to him. But it's worse than that. Because all of this that I just said supposes that you want to come to God. 
and you don't. Because nobody seeks after God, and nobody desires him. If there is any Godward motion in you whatsoever, it is the mercy of God that has put it in you. And this is the truth of Scripture. So all of your effort is filth. All of your righteousness is garbage. All of your best work cannot succeed in drawing you to God. But more than that and worse than that and far more binding than that is the reality that your own desires not only do not want God, but they are contrary to him. Your desires lead you farther away in everything that you do. James reminds us that we are led into sin when we are led away by our own desire. We are enticed by that which is still in us. And James was speaking to believers. So imagine what it is for those who are outside of Christ. You say, but I know lots of people who you wouldn't think is a Christian pastor because you're all arrogant, who, who, love, who love God. And I would say to you very simply that what they love is a God of their own imagination. And that's not arrogance on my part, by the way. That's a willingness to stand on the authority of Scripture and to judge everything that I judge according to what God says is true. I would urge you, I would encourage you, I would plead with you, disregard anything that I say that is of me. But any word that I speak to you that is anchored in the word of God, you ignore it at your eternal peril. You don't have to like it. In fact, if you're lost, I promise you won't. But I'm telling you the truth when I say you'd better heed it. Because God does not change his mind about anything. And what he says is true, is true, regardless of how we feel about it. So everything that's in us leads us not only not towards God, but away from him as far as we can. And what this means in its summation is that all of our paths lead to the destruction of our soul. Every single thing that we do leads to our damnation. Look back in Isaiah chapter 59. We'll turn back a few chapters. Isaiah 59, and we'll start reading at verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. What's, what's Isaiah saying? It's not that God can't hear you. It's that he won't. He sees everything that happens. There's nothing that happens that's hidden from his sight. The heart and the motives and the intention and the mind of man is plain before God. He understands completely what your intentions are. He understands completely what your will is. He understands completely what your desires are. And he understands what you want and need for when you pray. But if you are not found in Christ, it's not that God can't hear you, that he's somehow blocked away from it and that you're operating in the dark and God can't find you. It's not that God wishes he could save you, but somehow can't dredge up the power to change anything. It's that God will not hear those who are not found in Christ. He will not hear us because our only communication to him is through the blood of Jesus Christ shed for our forgiveness. That is our only path to him. And God will not hear us when we are not found in Christ. Reading on. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words. They speak lies. They conceive evil. They bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper's eggs, and they weave the spider's web. And he who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. For their works are the works of iniquity. And the acts of violence is in their feet, in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. And whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Now, before somebody says something silly to me, like, well, that's Old Testament, Pastor. We're a New Testament people. I remind you that you will find much of what I just read in Romans chapter 3. 
Those who seek God in their own strength and in their own ways make for themselves paths that will lead only to their destruction because they have not known the one way that God has provided. They have ignored it, they have despised it, they have hated it, and in doing so, they have sealed their condemnation. This is our need. <coughs> Pardon me. In the end, we always seek to make our own ways, and we seek to honor our own ideas. But none of those things that we seek to do will ever set us in good standing with God. The imagination of man is only that. It is man's imagination. It is man's pretense. And by definition, our pretenses are false. By definition, that's which we pretend to be true is not true. By definition, that which we wish was real is not. We are defiled in every sense of the word, and all of our righteousness is filthy rags. So where is the hope? Where is the good news? Well, the good news is that God himself purposed to save a people. Out of that wretched waste of humanity, out of that ocean of despair and vile action, God purposed to save a people. And it is not that he chose the best of us, because he chose me. It's not that he chose anything good. It is that he himself desired to save a people in such a way and for such a purpose as would bring the most possible glory to Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 8, Paul writes this. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus. To the intent, so here's God's purpose, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be, dis might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confidence with faith, or through faith in him. This is God's purpose. He determined to save a people, to magnify the glory and the greatness of Christ, to display his own goodness. So by saving us by his power, he is displaying to all who oppose him the perfection of his will and plan and purpose. So every single time God reaches into the mire of humanity and plucks out somebody that he chose before the foundations of the earth, and that person is the last person on the earth that we would have said, that's a good one. God receives more glory. God receives more praise. And he is displaying in the heavenly places the perfection of his will, his purpose, his plan, which he established before the world began. And he does this so that Christ is magnified in us. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 8, we find these words. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. But Paul says what? He says, look, everything that happens, happens for the sake of the glory of Christ. Everything that God has ordained is ordained so that Christ receive the glory, and he is the manifestation of the glory of God, and he is the demonstration of the eternal purpose and will that God had before anything was done. So, pardon me. One of the things 
that is often confused in people's minds is the question of why God does what he does. Often we set it in such a way that says God has chosen us because he saw in us something that would be good. But God chose us before the world began. God chose us before anything was done. Before God ever said, let there be light, he had already established a chosen people in Christ, which if you're thinking, also implies the reality that God ordained the world to be such that it would fall so that it could be redeemed. That was always his purpose. The, the idea of Christ coming to save a people is not an afterthought. It's not something that God came up with because Adam broke his perfect world. If that were the case, the scripture would say that God chose us in Christ from the Garden of Eden. Or God chose us in Christ before he kicked Adam out because Adam sinned. Or something along those lines. What the scripture attests to over and over and over again is that we were chosen in the beloved before the foundations of eternity. It was always the plan. And if this is always the plan, and this is always the purpose, then the purpose has to extend beyond us. The purpose has to be something which is bigger than us and larger than us. And graciously, God displays to us the truth that it is bigger and larger than us. It is the glory of Christ. Everything that God does is about the manifestation of the glory of Christ so that we might bring him praise and honor. Now, the good news for us is that as we are bringing Christ praise and honor for his glory as priest, it is also giving us the benefit of being delivered out of our sin, delivered out of the damnation which we have deserved, and delivering us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. There's hope in this. There's beauty in this. There's power in this. And that which is worth being praised is being praised. God determined to bring many sons to glory through the death of Christ and through the demonstration of what Christ came to do. Hebrews 2.10 says, It was fitting for him, for whom all things are and by whom all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. What does that mean? It means that in the end, what Christ endured made him the perfect priest for our need. It's not that Christ personally had to be perfected but that he had to be made completely fitting and perfect for the role of priest. In his person, he already was, but he had to fulfill the requirements of the priesthood. He had to fulfill everything that God determined was necessary for him to do this. And he did this through the intercession and the intervention of Jesus Christ. And by his suffering, he became perfectly fit for our salvation. By everything that he endured, by all of his misery, by all of his death, by everything that he accomplished at Calvary, by his resurrection and by his intercession afterwards, he became the perfect Savior. He was perfectly fitted then, not only as the sacrificer, but as the sacrifice itself. Do you remember what we read in the very first part of Deuteronomy this morning? You cannot bring to God a sacrifice that has any blemish or any de defect at all. Why? Because those sacrifices were a type of Christ. Christ being the archetype was absolutely perfect and is displayed as perfection. And in his display as perfection, even in the types of the sacrifices being offered, we see Jesus exalted. Christ became our sacrifice and was perfectly fitted for the job. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, starting at verse 17. Peter writes this. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. So this means that everything brings glory and honor to the Father. This is because God is honored in the giving. 
When God provides for us a Savior according to our need and His provision, He receives the glory. He receives the honor. He is magnified. God is both the author and the provider of our salvation, and it is His wisdom, His grace, and His goodness which is magnified in the condescension He shows in saving a people unworthy of being saved. Right? If I do something nice for you because you're an excellent person, it says something good about me, but it says something far better about you. Right? If I'm nice to you because you are a good and noble and kind person, it is me recognizing something in you that I admire. Well, is there anything in us that God would admire? No. So when God does something good for miserable wretches like us, who receives the glory? Is it us? No, it's Him. And that is as it should be. God receives the glory for providing for us a Savior. He receives the glory for reaching into our mess and delivering us according to His purpose and according to His will. He receives the glory because He is the only one who has done anything good. He is the only one who has shown Himself to be perfect. And He provided everything that was needed by giving us our salvation. Colossians chapter 1 Starting at verse 12 says this, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You see, God providing Christ for us designed the way. And then after He designed the way, He provided the Savior that we needed. This makes sense? So, if Christ is a fitting Savior, it's also important that we begin to understand some of what His fitting Savior attributes are and the need that they were designed to deliver us from. Amen? It was fitting that God would provide a Savior, and therefore there are some things that we can learn about His role as Savior that are unique to Christ, that are honoring to Christ, that are glorifying to Christ, and in the end are going to bring glory and honor to the Father who not only provided this Savior, but designed the system in the first place, that He would be everything that is needed. This glorious truth magnifies the majesty and the goodness of God. So the very first thing that we need to understand about this fitting work of the priest is that He alone made atonement for our sins fully and completely expiating them. Okay, so expiation is the reality of our guilt being removed. It is the removal of not only our guilt, but the consequent liability for our guilt. When you're guilty of something, you deserve a consequence because of the guilt. Right? So, and I'm being, I'm going to be slightly technical this morning about the different aspects of salvation because you guys can keep up with it. I'm confident that you can derive some good from it. I don't want to just toss out a bunch of empty words. I want you to understand what's going on because this is magnificent, glorious truth. When God expiates our sin, that means that He takes away not only our guilt, but everything that our guilt deserves. There's a fundamental reality in life when we look at somebody who has done something wicked and we say to ourselves, whether we say it out loud or not, we say, that man deserves punishment for what he did. Sometimes the world works in such a way that they receive punishment immediately. Sometimes we have to hope and pray that God will keep his word and that they will be punished in the end. But we see wickedness and we see guilt and we think to ourselves that deserves something. Do you think that you're exempt from that? When you're wicked and you're guilty and you're acting in a way that's contrary to God, do you not think that righteousness would say you're guilty and you deserve something bad because of it? Yeah. We do deserve terrible, awful things because of our guilt. Because we actively pursue wickedness, because we actively work against God, because we actively hate Him, because we actively seek to work in ways that are contrary to everything that He desires and everything that He tells us, because our desires as righteous people still lead us into sin, we deserve punishment. 
But God in his mercy expiates our guilt. He takes it away. And in taking it away in Christ, if our guilt is taken away, is not also our deserving of punishment removed? Amen, it is. God has removed the obligation to punish us by expiating our sin in Christ. He has taken it out of the way. It is no longer a requirement that we be punished. It is a substantive transformation which transfers our guilt to another in its place. Now, this is pictured for us in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system of the lamb and the scapegoat. In the end, every single time there was a sacrifice being made, the one who was sacrificing was to lay their hands on the head of the sacrifice and confess over it their guilt. It transferred their sin to the one who was being slain, and it gave to them also the reciprocal transfer of the death being counted to their credit. Now, it was a temporary exchange because the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin, according to Scripture. But it gave to us the type of what Christ was going to do. So in Leviticus chapter 1, starting at verse 4, it says this, He shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So when a sacrifice was being offered, the, the giver would lay their hand on it, and then it would be counted as their death. This also worked in regards to the people as a whole. On the Day of Atonement, there would be two goats, and they would be drawn by lot by God, and the one goat would be the sacrifice, and the other goat was called, you know what it was called? The scapegoat. And the scapegoat is the guy who bore the blame. We carry that word into our vernacular. People talk about somebody being taken as a scapegoat, and it means you get to bear the consequence for what somebody else did. You're the fall guy, right? So the scapegoat is a scriptural idea, and Aaron, or the high priest, whoever it was at that time, would lay their hands on the scapegoat and would confess over the scapegoat all of the sins of the people. The, the other goat was taken as a sacrifice, and the scapegoat bore the guilt of the people out of the camp. He was led out into the wilderness and released, presumably to die. But what this shows us is that Christ Jesus bore our guilt and bore our sins. He was both the sacrifice and the scapegoat, which is why he was sacrificed outside of the camp. He was led outside of, the, outside of Jerusalem, remember? He had to carry the cross through the city and out of the city. So he was sacrificed outside as our scapegoat, but he was sacrificed also as the one who bore our iniquity. So he became for us that which removed our guilt. Now, in the fullness of everything that God has done, he did this so that we are cleansed before him. He did this so that we are acceptable in his sight. Our guilt has been removed. We have been expiated from our sin, expiated from our guilt, and expiated from the consequence of our guilt, which itself has been removed. Now, this also means that in our own consideration, we have to remember that this has been done. Look, if you're found in Christ and your guilt has been expiated, do you need to deal with God as if he still sees you as guilty and deserving of wrath? No. I mean, if, if God says to you, I have forgiven you, and you say, yeah, no, I don't think so. I think I'm still guilty. I think I'm still deserving of wrath. I think I'm still awful. I think that you still hate me. Are you going to come to him as you're supposed to? No, you're going to seek to try and find some way to expiate your own guilt. You're going to seek to try and work for your salvation. And by doing so, you're going to be giving testimony that you don't believe Christ is who he says he is. We need to wrestle this out, and we need to understand the tension that exists between the fact that we are intrinsically guilty by our actions and by our attitudes and by everything that we do, but also we have been justified by the blood of Christ. We have had our guilt removed. We have been expiated by his death. And so we are accepted in the presence of God as if 
we were no longer guilty. This is what's at the heart of 2 Corinthians 5.21 when God says, He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ as if it were ours. He counts it to our credit. He gives to us the full and complete righteousness of Jesus and declares us right. He declares us cleansed and acceptable in his sight. And it also has the impact of purging our consciences from the dead works that used to destroy us. Hebrews 9, starting at verse 13, says, If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So one of the biggest things that keeps us from faithfully serving the king is this resurgent feeling of guilt. I'm just not worthy. Scripture says, no, you're not, but that's okay. Christ is. Scripture says, don't count on your worthiness. Stand on his. Because our consciences have been cleansed from those dead works by the blood of Christ. And God calls us to serve and calls us to walk with him in wherever he leads us so that we might fulfill everything that he has made us to do. In the end, he offers us the opportunity to serve the living God. He offers us the opportunity to serve the God who actually is. And he doesn't hold us back from that. He doesn't disqualify us from service because of our past lives. We have been fully and completely sanctified by his blood. Hebrews 10, 14 says, By one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Well, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, Such were some of you, speaking after a very long list of wicked things, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So he has redeemed us. He has expiated our guilt. He has cleansed our consciences from dead works. And he has done this so that we might receive the promised inheritance. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9.15 now, this means that he has not only cleansed us and promised to us an inheritance and done what is necessary for that inheritance, but he has done all of this by purchasing our eternal redemption. So redemption is all about purchase. Redemption is all about the buying of something which has been lost. Um, in our culture and in our world, um, it is, it's the picture of the pawn shop. Um, when you take something to the pawn shop and you say to them, um, yeah, I'm not a good manager of my money. I, when I worked construction in Phoenix, I saw this all the time. Guys would go about two days before their payday and they would pawn their tools because they didn't have anything else and they needed money to go drink. And they would go pawn their tools and they would take their tools to the pawn shop and they would say, yeah, okay, I'm going to give you this and this and this because I don't think I'm going to need these particular tools in the next two days, and you're going to lend me some money so I can go drinking, and then when I get paid on Friday, I'm going to come back into the pawn shop, and I'm going to redeem my tools for about 20% increase. I'm going to buy back that which was mine for a higher price than it's worth because I want what's mine, and I'm going to take whatever it takes to buy back what belongs to me. This is the picture of redemption. God bought us. He purchased us by his blood. And he purchased us for a price that far exceeds any intrinsic worth in us. He purchased us for a price that goes far beyond anything that we would ever have expected anybody to do, least alone God. But he buys us back and buys us back because he desires to have that which is his own. Ephesians chapter 1 starting at verse 3. Listen to how Paul puts this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. He pours out the fullness of his spirit over us, redeeming us from our own damnation, purchasing us back from that into which we had sold ourselves by sin. And he does this and doesn't stop there. He adopts us into his family as his blood-bought children. He makes us his own child. He does not allow anything to separate us from himself. And this is the fitting work of the priest. And in doing this, he pours out the fullness of his spirit over us so that we can begin to think and act and live like part of the family. Make sense? The, the very first thing that has to happen to us is that we have to be changed in our very nature. And God does this through regeneration. He makes us new. But he still has to teach us the way the family works. He still has to teach us the, the rules of the world according to his own pleasure. And he does this through his spirit coming to live inside of us. His spirit dwells in our hearts and illuminates his word to us so that we may have the privilege of knowing God. Remember John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that they may know you and the son whom you have sent. This is what it means to have eternal life. It is to know God. It enables us to know God's will. John 14, 26 says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. So Jesus Christ promises that his spirit will come dwell inside of us and give us light and understanding and the ability to recall what he has said in his word so that we might know what we are called to do and to be. And look at John 16. John chapter 16, starting at verse 13. So John chapter 16, starting at verse 13, we find these words. Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking about the Spirit. He says this, Whoever, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come, and he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. And therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Jesus is very determined that we who are his children would know the will of God. Jesus is very determined that we who are chosen by God would have everything necessary to live out the fullness of what that means. That we will have the opportunity to walk in the fullness of truth and he will give us faith so that we can believe what he says. Do we have faith as a natural inherent condition? No. Faith is not something that you possess in and of yourselves. If you have faith to believe what God has said, it is the gift of God. Paul writes that in Ephesians chapter 2. This faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ultimately, what this means is that the ability to believe God's word comes to us by God himself. And this allows us to live out the fullness of everything that he calls us to do. A little bit further on in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes that you have been saved by faith. And then he goes on and he says, For we are his workmanship, created for good works, which God appointed beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Everything that God has ordained for us to do, God himself provides the power and the faith and the ability to accomplish his will and his purpose. Now, why is this? This is because he has chosen to make us his children and has redeemed us by a fitting high priest who completely bridged the gap that existed between us as fallen humanity and a holy God who was calling us unto himself. Look, when man builds a bridge, it inevitably fails. It inevitably falls apart. It inevitably does not reach its final destination. You only have to drive on a road for a little while to realize this is true. The same is true spiritually. When man seeks to make a way to get to God, it fails halfway there. Because fundamentally, we cannot do what is necessary. But when God ordains a path and ordains a way and makes a priest, he does it in a way that is fitting for all of our need. We need to know what the standard is for God's law. We need to understand how to live out according to his word. We need power that we do not possess. We need him to strengthen us, to enable us to worship. Is it possible for somebody who does not know Christ to worship God? No, not at all. They can come in, they can sing the songs, they can sit quietly under the sermon, they can even try to pray with us. But they cannot worship because they do not know God and their hearts are not towards him. It is impossible for anybody to worship God because God is seeking for worshipers who fulfill a specific requirement. And what is that? According to Jesus, when he was speaking to the woman at the well, he said, our father is searching for those who will worship him. How? In spirit and in truth. In spirit means by the spirit of God who dwells in those who belong to him. And in truth means in accordance to his word, his will, his way. God determines what worship is, not us. So strong men bending bars of iron around their head is not worship. It may be fun, it may be entertaining, it may be amusing, but it is not worship. Worship is decreed by the will of God. And if we would worship, we must worship him according to his will, his purpose, his power, and his ways. And God gives us this in his spirit. When his spirit comes to dwell in us, we are then enabled to worship God in spirit. Amen? It's his who has done it. It is his will. It is his work. It is his way. He has permitted us to come into his presence to actually worship according to his spirit, who comes to live inside of us. And more than that, the spirit also strengthens us for obedience to what God has told us to do. First Peter chapter 1 reads thus, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, listen to this, in sanctification of the spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ to you. So the Spirit dwells in us for the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. The sanctification that comes to us by his death. He is our consolation in all of our trials. He is our consolation in all of our difficulty. He is our consolation in everything that comes against us. And he is merciful. Beloved, he pours out his heart of pity upon us. And I know that arrogance of man says, I don't want your pity. Well, if we're dealing with God, that's the only thing you want. Because if God deals with us as equals, if God deals with us according to our own worth, if God deals with us according to what we deserve, we will be damned. The only thing we want is pity. The only thing we want is mercy. The only thing we want is grace. We want God to give us what we do not deserve. 
our longing. That's our prayer. That's our hope. And he does it because he's good. He does it because his love for us is based upon himself. And he preserves us from everything that will destroy us. Out of this heart of pity, out of this heart of compassion. 1 Thessalonians 5 says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't stop there, though. He says this, He who calls you is faithful, and he also will do it. God preserves his own. Jude 1 says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, is those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Christ Jesus. He grants to us the promised eternal life. John chapter 10, the words of Jesus are worth reading. John chapter 10, starting at verse 27, Jesus says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. This is the promise of God. And knowing Christ in God, knowing God in Christ, is eternal life. Right? This is what eternal life is. It is knowing Him. Now, this also means that our priest, who is our hope to have access to God, is himself our life. He is the one who grants to us life. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4 says, You died, you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So let me ask you this fundamental question. If you are hoping in anything but Christ for life, then when Christ, who is the only hope of life, appears, Will you find life in him if you're not found in him? No, you can't. You cannot have your whole hope placed in anything else and then at the end say, oh, okay, never mind, I want Jesus. When Christ appears, our life appears with him. But if our life has not been hidden in him, we are without hope. This is why it was fitting that God would prepare a priest such as Christ. Look again at Hebrews 7. I promise you we'd come back to it. Hebrews chapter 7, starting at verse 26, it says, For such a high priest was fitting for us. Beloved, everything that God required us to possess in order to have a relationship with him is found in our high priest, Jesus Christ who is fitting to provide our need. Do not search for your need any place else. You will not find it. But in Christ, every need you have, every single thing that will ever be required of you is provided for you. You know what makes God so amazing in our salvation? He will never ask you for anything that he has not first given you. Isn't that cool? He doesn't expect you to come up with any part of it. He doesn't say, okay, Jesus, you've done 99.99999% of it. Now, you guys got to work out that last one ten thousand. If he did that, we would all perish. But God gives to us everything that he then requires. And he does so graciously, demanding no payment, for payment has already been made in Christ, calling us unto his own, making us his children, expiating our guilt, redeeming us from our corruption, providing for us his spirit, his power, giving to us purpose, giving to us hope. Everything that is needed is found in this fitting high priest who has become for us 
our salvation. Let's pray. God, I ask that you give to us grace in these days. And I pray, Father, that as we seek your face and seek your counsel, we would be found faithful according to your word and transformed into the image of Christ. And God, I pray that if there's anybody in the sound of my voice, whether here or on the radio or on the internet or anywhere, God, that you would grant to them life that all who do not know you would come to the knowledge of Christ and that Christ would be honored by those by whom he is now hated. And I pray, Father, over and above all of these things, that our eyes and our vision and our desire would be steadfastly fixed upon you. Transform us into the likeness of Christ. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray.